Good afternoon. My name is Quentin Ucham and I'm the Secretary of the Society for the Study of Labour History. My presentation this afternoon is one of what is hoped to be many contributions in an area of increasing interest to Labour historians, and that is the area of Labour history and the emotions. This presentation treats the emotions involved in the great English coal lockout of 1893. At the start of this conflict, miners and coal owners were said to enjoy an amicable understanding, but before too long, miners were threatening to tear a colliery foreman limb from limb. So we see a transformation from relatively calm and peaceful emotions to anger and the threat of violence. My focus here is on the anger and in particular the relationship between anger and the reason involved in running a dispute, a dispute of two sides here, workers and capitalists. The two sides have to negotiate and negotiations usually involve the use of reason. So what is the relationship between the angry emotions that were soon seen in this conflict and the reason required to bring the conflict to an end and negotiate a term, a return to work? Okay, so this presentation is rather long, so I'm going to uh, present it in two halves. This is the first half. I'm going to deliver the presentation by talking to a deck of PowerPoint slides, and I hope if I can get my head around the technology that I can share these with you to use the technical term. So please just give me a moment or two while I get this going. The slideshow opens with what will seem a rather odd picture for a presentation about a coal mining strike. It's a picture of a fresco painted by Tiepolo in 1757. It depicts a scene from Homer's Iliad, showing the confrontation between King Agamemnon, who's on the left, and Achilles, who's on the right. This is the point at which the enraged Achilles draws his sword from its sheath as the idea of killing Agamemnon enters his head. But he's restrained from this by the goddess Athena, the figure on the extreme right, who seizes him by his hair in a what you'd think was a, a very undignified action to be borne by the hero Achilles. She's rushed down from Mount Olympus in order to restrain Achilles in his anger or as it's often translated in his wrath. So this scene is often interpreted by translators and commentators as an example of Homer's use of godly intervention to metamorphose and externalize what are internal mental and emotional conflicts. More recently, however, classicists have come to argue that the Greeks recognized no conflict or split between reason and emotion. The anger felt by Achilles and the restraint exercised by Athena should both be seen as aspects of the same personality, as it was understood at least by the Greeks. So this neatly captures one of the ideas that I want to pursue in this presentation this afternoon, that to think in terms of a split or division between emotion and reason is not helpful. Before moving on, uh, let me give my thanks and acknowledgements. This talk was first presented at the Emotions in Conflict Conference organized by the Society for the History of Emotions of Australia, which wasn't in Australia, but in Canada at the University of Ottawa in October 2019. I'd like to thank the organizers and the participants in that conference, particularly Mark Sells, Jim Jaffe, Claudia Jarzyboski and Susan Matt for their comments and amity. The usual disclaimer applies. So let me fill you in a little bit about the lockout. I call it a lockout because it was precipitated by an attempt by the owners, which is how the miners employers were usually referred to, to reduce wages significantly in what were called the federated areas. That is to say, the areas organized by the Miners Federation of Great Britain. These covered a large part of England, but not Scotland and not South Wales at this point, but actually not all of England. The major coal fields in the northeast were not affiliated to the Federation at this point. So we're actually talking Yorkshire, Lancashire, Derbyshire, Nottinghamshire and parts of the Midlands, Staffordshire and Warwickshire and so forth. Although it didn't include every mining district in the country, it was still a very, very big dispute. 
Indeed, it was then the largest industrial dispute ever known in Britain, with about 300,000 workers involved. It also lasted a long time, from the 28th of July to 17th of November, 16 long, hungry weeks. At first it was fairly calm, but disturbances broke out from August onwards, and in September the conflict was marked by an event called the Featherstone Massacre. This was on September the 7th, and it was an event in which large crowds of miners were confronted by soldiers. If the riot act was read and the soldiers opened fire. One miner was shot dead, another was mortally wounded, and others were injured. So that's the conflict. The photograph here shows a heavy policing that was involved from time to time in parts of Yorkshire. It's a photograph taken at Tankersley Colliery. Tankersley is just north of Barnsley in what's now known as South Yorkshire. And if you're wondering where Featherstone is, well, let me enlighten you. This is a modern map and it shows you Featherstone in relation to the motorway network. Um, I've shown you this um, as perhaps a more familiar network than the contemporary railway network, which would have been uh, more uh, uh, well known by contemporaries, of course. Mm. Featherstone's in the middle. Mm. To the west of Featherstone is the M1 running north and south. To the east is the A1 again running north and south. The junction of the A1 with the M62 at Ferry Bridge is only a few miles away from Featherstone. The closest towns are Pontefract, then the location of an army barracks, and the glass and coal mining centre of Castleford, now just north of the M62. Normanton, another coal mining town, and also an, an important railway centre, is to the west, and so is Wakefield, the headquarters of the county police forces. So I hope that gives you an idea of the geographical location of the events we shall be discussing. I want to focus on two issues here. Firstly, why did the conflict turn violent? And I'm rather taking it for granted that considering the emotions there is or should be a major part of that consideration. And if emotions turn violent, what happened to reason in this conflict? But there's one question which you may be asking yourselves already. Why look at this conflict? Why not look at, say, the 1984-5 miners strike or the Liverpool transport strike of 1911 or any of the other obvious candidates. Well, the reason I'm looking at this strike in particular is, to be perfectly honest, because I happen to live quite near to Featherstone in Leeds, and I've been interested in its history for quite some time. But there are some more general reasons as well, which I hope might convince you. And these lie in the quality and multiplicity of the sources available. First of all, we have newspaper accounts. By the 1890s, we're in a media world in which even quite small towns have their own weekly, sometimes even daily, newspapers. So, for instance, in 1893, they'd been running for some time, since 1880, in fact, the Pontefract and Castleford Express, which covered and still covers Featherstone, often in some detail. Because two people were killed, there were inquests, and the evidence offered at those inquests especially of one of the men killed, James Gibbs, was reported in great detail in the local and regional papers, such as the Leeds Mercury and the Sheffield Independent. There was also a committee of inquiry established to discover what had gone wrong and why two people had been shot dead by British soldiers on British soil. Evidence was heard in public at this inquiry and it was published alongside the report of the committee. It was chaired by a chap called Lord Bowen, and so you'll hear me referring to something called the Bowen Inquiry from time to time. Prior to the sittings of that inquiry, the Treasury Solicitor's Department in London had sent up a young man, Francis, I'm sorry, Francis J. Sims, to gather evidence from witnesses and other interested parties in the area. And the records made by this very enterprising and inquisitive civil servant are now preserved in the National Archives. And lastly, we have an account written by a working class writer called Sam Wood. And this is really unusual. Sam Wood, as I'll indicate in more detail in a moment or two, was an authentic member of the working classes. And he was also in a position to see what was going on and to hear accounts of what was going on from friends, neighbours and relatives. 
These sources often give evidence from participants or witnesses, and sometimes the evidence is in what purports to be verbatim speech. But it's been edited, of course, so all the errs and ums have been taken out and other faults amended. So it's what I refer to as pseudo verbatim reported speech. It's similar in this sense to the reports in Hansard of proceedings in the House of Commons. So this is the reason I would probably use to try and convince you that this conflict is a particularly useful one to consider if you're interested in emotions and labour history. Let me just give you a few more details about Sandwood because as I said, it's really unusual to have any lengthy account of an industrial dispute by a working class writer. He was a 31 year old boiler maker at the time of the lockout. He lived uh, at number four Keir Street in Barnsley, the middle of the three terrace houses you can see in the photograph on the screen in front of you. The street was built sometime after 1888 and possibly as late as 1904. It's tempting to assume it was named after Keir Hardy, but I'm afraid it seems much more likely to have been named after George Keir, a prominent Barnsley attorney who had by this time been dead for some years. Keir Street still stands and a photograph at the top end of the street is on the slide in front of you. Sam was coal mining relations included his father, who was a colliery banksman, and a brother, Charles, who was a colliery labourer. His next door neighbours included a chap called Alfred Broadhead at number two, nearest the camera, who worked in a linen warehouse, and John Swift at number six, to the extreme right, who was himself a coal miner. The picture shows you the very cramped conditions these three men were living in, along with their families, of course. So all this confirms Sam Wood's class position. OK, so that's Sam Wood, and I'll be quoting from him from time to time later in the presentation. What this multiplicity of sources means is that I do not, unlike many historians of the emotions, have to rely on conduct books as a major source. This has been a big problem in the field. How do we know what feelings were regarded as acceptable? What feelings were approved? What emotions must be suppressed? What emotions could be freely expressed? And so on and so forth. Well, for a very, very long time now, the shortage of direct evidence has led people to examine conduct books, which were published instruction manuals about how to manage yourself emotionally. A large number of these were produced in the Victorian and Edwardian period, and the example on your screen is just one of them. The trouble with sources like this is we don't know who actually read these conduct books. Were they working class? Probably not, unless they had aspirations for social advancement. So such books may tell us, if they tell us anything at all, about the middle classes rather than the working classes. Nor do we know how much attention the people who did read them whether working class or middle class, pay to them. So that you can easily see there are major problems in using conduct books to pursue the history of the emotions, particularly if we're interested in the emotions of the working classes. So I haven't relied on conduct books, thank heavens, nor have I relied on fiction. It's often been assumed that writers of fiction, especially so-called realist fiction, as exemplified by the 19th century novel, can be taken as good guides to contemporary emotions or contemporary manners, how people felt and how they expressed their feelings. But this is a dangerous assumption, I think. Novelists have all sorts of reasons for depicting emotions as they do, not least to convey excitement and interest to the reader, and not least to confirm the prejudices of their readers about, for example, and not least, the feelings and manners of the working classes. The view that novels document at least the manners of society is an old one. Charles Knight, the editor of Half Hours with the Best Authors, an anthology of recommended readings, wrote in 1850, the novel, especially in that cheap issue which finds its entrance to thousands of households, furnishes the chief material from which the future philosophical historian will learn what were our modes of thought and of living, our vices and our follies, our pretensions and our realities in the middle of the 19th century. This introduced an extract from Vanity Fair, which Knight praised as the work of an acute observer and its observer as amongst the most successful 
of all those who have come after Mr Dickens. Although Vanity Fair's Becky Sharp is said to be penniless, she's not working class and the very extensive cast of other characters contains very few working people, nor do the events of the novel include a strike or any of the other dramatic events of working class life. It would be a very difficult source to utilise for this presentation. What about novels then which take strikes as their central theme? These do exist. There's an example on the slide in front of you. The Seed She Sowed by Emma Leslie is a novel allegedly about the great dock strike of 1889. It's an unknown work by an author of some present obscurity, although she published over 100 novels during her lifetime. Um, uh, and that lifetime uh, didn't draw to a close until 1909. Emma Leslie was actually a pseudonym. Her real name was Emma Boltwood and she specialised in children's and historical fiction written for the Religious Tract Society and the Sunday School Union. She made her living through authorship. But it's by no means clear that despite relying on her living, uh, uh, from her authorship, uh, which might uh, lead one to expect that she would research her uh, subjects in some detail, it's by no means clear that Emma Leslie would have experienced the great dock strike herself or that her friends or relations would have been able to inform her. So here too there are problems. We may be reading fiction in the pejorative sense as well as in the literary sense that we do not have to rely on such texts as sources here is therefore a relief. OK, so enough about methodology. Let me now move on to give you the first section of a narrative of this dispute. Here's a picture that I hope you'll find decorative. It's a scene from Othello where Othello is relating his life story to Desdemona. Is purely ornamental huh? here, and I use it simply to signal that some narrative is coming up. So when you see this picture, huh? um, you can be assured that I'm getting back to telling the story. As I've already indicated, at the very beginning of the dispute, of the dispute in late July and early August, people were saying, or rather being reported in newspapers as saying, there's not much temper all seem to accept the situation calmly and deliberately. This was the answer given by a Yorkshire miner, a Czech wayman, who was asked what was the feeling on the subject by a reporter for the Pontefract and Castleford Express. The Leeds Mercury remarked that there is no bitterness of feeling. Seldom has a crisis like the present culminated with so amicable an understanding between the parties. It was seen that it is, to quote the most recent diplomatic phrase, a Pacific blockade of the mines that is intended. And the Barnsley Chronicle agreed. A reporter for the Chronicle wrote, both sides mean fighting, but they begin on friendly terms and reciprocating the good feeling which the men have shown, it had been arranged that the men's tools should remain down the pits with the implication that all would be able to return to their old places at the end of the dispute, something which is by no means guaranteed in the coal mining strikes and lockouts of the era. Sam Wood noted also that the miners had been allowed to remain in their colliery houses instead of being threatened with eviction by their employers, often also their landlords, as had happened in previous disputes. The local Featherston newspaper remarked that the mid-August Featherston feast was as brisk and frolicsome as ever. One miner recently returned with his family from holiday in Southport, cheerfully told the reporter that if the strike did not end soon, he would take his family off for another fortnight's holiday, this time to Scarborough. But underneath this air of light-hearted indifference, continued the reporter, was a determined confidence. The men entertain little fear that in the end they will not come off conquerors, and there seems to be a very determined feeling among some that they will not give in whatever may be the results. And that was the Leeds Mercury for the 29th of July, 1893. 
But uh, as we've seen, August passed and in early September, a violent disturbance took place at Acton Hall Colliery in Featherstone. Troops were deployed. James Duggan and James Gibbs, who it was admitted on all sides, took no part in any rioting, any violence, any arson, any destruction of property, were shot dead or mortally wounded by the troops. At least nine others were wounded by the troops, and so this became known as the Featherstone Massacre. There on the slide is the only contemporary depiction of the scene that I've been able to find. It's to some extent imaginary. No other account that I've seen mentions the holding of miners' trade union banners aloft, for instance. You can see a pair of them to the left huh, of the scene there. The conflagration that is, that is depicted seems rather greater than is described by contemporaries, but nevertheless, the large numbers of people shown present is certainly accurate. We are indeed looking at an incident involving several thousand people. OK, so why this transformation from light-hearted indifference to violent confrontation? Let me just summarise for a moment. Mm. Why this transformation? Well, I'm going to put forth some working assumptions here. I'm going to assume them rather than trying to justify them because that would take even more time than I'm going to take with you this afternoon. I'm going to assume that violence is preceded by anger, that this is the emotional background to violence and certainly in this particular episode. I'm aware that some violence uh, may be presumed calmly at times, but this is clearly not one of those episodes. So where did the anger come from? Again, I'm going to frame a working assumption that anger is induced by bodily or mental distress. For bodily distress, I'm thinking of things like pain. I'm thinking of hunger, but also drunkenness. I'm assuming that mental distress may be provoked by insults. So when we are looking at anger, we are also usually looking at pain, real or imagined, and we're often looking at provocations and insults too, whether they be real or imagined. So at this point, it's helpful to explore a little bit further what anger is and also what reason is, because we often implicitly contrast emotion with reason. So here we contrast the actions of people who were angry with the actions of people who were behaving under the guidance of reason. That's a contrast that goes back a long way, though it is perhaps most characteristic in Britain, at least, of the 18th century. And I think it's helpful to consider this contrast explicitly rather than implicitly, as is usually the case in uh, such historical uh, enterprises as this uh, presentation. First of all, to look at anger. We seem to have lost much sense of nuance when it comes to talking about anger. The vocabulary we have for discussing anger is very extensive. We can talk about irritation, resentment, indignation, anger, wrath, fury, rage, but discussion is increasingly dominated by just plain anger. We can demonstrate this loss of nuance using Google's count of n-grams. Broadly speaking, n-grams are words. The counts are from a text corpus of British English. They're graphed on the slide in front of you, which gives counts from 1900 to the year 2000. You can see that the counts for uses of anger rise fairly steadily from about 1950. Fury is the next one down at the right hand side of the graph, and it shows a massive hike during the 1930s and 1940s, for which I've got no immediate explanation. And then it falls again. Counts for all the other terms, rage, the next one down, wrath, the next one down, resentment, irritation and indignation are fairly stable. So the consequence is that anger is an increasing proportion of all the anger terms, including anger itself, from about 1950. So if we look at the counts of the engram anger, that's 38% of the sum of the counts of anger, fury, rage and wrath in 1900. It's 26% in 1950, so it goes down to quite low levels in 1950, but it's 47% in 2000. In case you're a bit dubious about Google and its count of engrams and so on, well, I think everybody has their doubts. Uh, 
But if you conduct a similar exercise as I've done of counts of words, not engrams, just plain words, in the digital British newspaper archive, which is available over the same period, one finds very similar results. Anger is more and more the only word which people use to refer to what we might previously have referred to as irritation, resentment, indignation, wrath and fury, or indeed rage. So I've said that we seem to be losing a degree of nuance in talking about these varieties of angry emotion. So how can we actually distinguish them? I think it's useful here to look at what may seem to be a rather old resource, George Crabbe's English synonyms. Let me just dip for a moment. George Crabbe's English Cinnamons was first published in 1816. The title page on the slide in front of you is from the third edition of 1824. So you'll see it went through its editions fairly rapidly. And indeed it was republished and new editions were produced. New editions with very little change in them, I have to say, right up to the First World War. And so it's possible to treat it as a standard book of reference for the whole Victorian and Edwardian period, I think, despite the fact that it was originated as early as 1816. If we turn to Crabbe's English Cinnamons and look up anger, we will find a discussion of how it is to be distinguished from similar emotion words like wrath, because Crabbe's book didn't simply tell you that uh, anger was a synonym for wrath, uh, it attempted to distinguish anger from wrath uh, so that one could use these apparent or alleged synonyms uh, precisely and carefully and accurately. So, for instance, here Crabbe suggests that wrath is more vivid than anger. The source of it is often unbending pride in the person expressing it. Also, says Crabbe, it's often experienced as, as the sentiment of a superior to an inferior. But the experience, thinks Crabbe, is really unjustifiable because this work is also a work of morality between man and man. It's really for God only. So this suggests some quite major distinctions between these two emotion words. What about anger versus rage versus fury here? Crabbe suggests that the three terms show a progressive force and he tries to explain this by using a common strategy at the time, which he clearly felt was a perfectly reasonable one, whatever doubts we might have about it. And this was to infer meaning and nuances of meaning from etymologies, even if the etymologies were really quite distant, for instance, from the Latin rather than recent, perhaps from modern French. So when discussing the English word rage, he refers back to its origin in the Latin word rabies, madness. Fury, he notes, comes from furor, the Latin for to carry away, as in to be carried away by one's own emotions. He also refers to the Greek Eumenides, that is to say the spirits uh, the Romans knew as the Furies, who came not from Hades, but from the region even lower than Hades, known to the Greeks and Romans as Tartarus. So wrath is Olympian, we've seen Crabbe suggesting it is for the gods only, but Fury is hellish. So again, he's developing quite significant distinctions between these words, which are often these days used as if they were synonyms. The Crabbe is suggesting this, that given that his book was a standard reference work for almost the whole of the 19th century, suggests that skilled readers, at least in the 19th century, were aware of these nuances. And when I say skilled readers, I'm not thinking only of the classically educated middle passes. I'm including many of the working class poets and fiction writers that have come to an increasing prominence in cultural histories of the period in recent years. OK, so here's a depiction from the 17th century of what rage actually means. It's a depiction of the rage of Hercules, which is an episode where in a fit of madness, Hercules kills his wife and children. So here it's being suggested that rage is incompatible with reason. Hercules is depicted as someone who has lost his reason. He's mad. 
OK, so Crab continues to point out some other distinctions which may be useful. He said anger may be so stifled as not to discover itself, that is to reveal itself by any. Excuse me, outward. Excuse me again, symptoms. Rage, on the other hand, breaks forth into extravagant expressions and violent distortions. Fury takes away the use of the understanding. So here he's suggesting that rather than the rage of Hercules, we should perhaps be talking about the fury of Hercules, because Hercules we know has lost his reason, his ability to understand, rather than the somewhat term, weaker term rage. In rage, reason may perhaps be distorted and the expression of reasons may become extravagant, but Crabbe doesn't suggest uh, that in moments of rage, one could be said to have lost one's reasons altogether. But that is something which we might well want to discuss. It's not um, clear cut. Despite this, it seems fairly clear that to skilled readers at least, and to skilled writers in the 19th century, anger was regarded as compatible with reason. Fury was not. Rage was regarded as least distorted reason. OK, so we see that these emotion terms have important distinctions, at least according to Crab, and there are good reasons for taking Crab as a good guide to, as I say, the understanding of educated and skilled readers and writers in almost the whole of the 19th century. So if that is anger and some related words, then what can we say of reason? Reason is often just not discussed in histories the, of the emotions, and yet we need a model for reason, because what we might mean by reason is by no means clear. It's often assumed that the best model for reason is actually mathematics, that all by that is to say, to indubitable truths, for instance, that one plus one is equal to two. Well, here in the box on the slide in front of you is the proof of that proposition that one plus one is equal, excuse me, is equal to two, as given by Alfred North Whitehead and Bertrand Russell in their Principia Mathematica just before the First World War. And you can see it uses a whole raft of unusual symbols. And indeed, Whitehead and Russell were attempting to show that mass could be reduced to logic, and therefore much of the symbolism there on the screen is more familiar as symbolic logic than as mathematics. And it's certainly not a model of reason which we could suggest was in daily use, even by highly rational and highly intelligent people. It's far too demanding, far, far too demanding. Even Bertrand Russell himself did not use reasoning of this sort when writing about why the world should immediately engage in nuclear disarmament, for instance, or indeed in, in even more, even in more obviously philosophical matters. So th that model of reason is really not helpful. And yet it's often the model that's implicit in people's discussions of the emotions when they're one astray and that one should be led instead by reason, by a sequence of propositions that could be put down in principle at least in mathematical form. Well, that's too demanding. But surely we can use a slightly less demanding model of reason and suggest that reason is like logic. And we all know these logistic examples. All people are mortal. Socrates was a person. Therefore, Socrates was mortal. Yes, clearly that's a reasonable conclusion to derive from those propositions, but these examples are too simple to have any real application to historical episodes of interest. The problems that one is faced with in ordinary everyday life and in the conduct of an industrial dispute, for instance, are very difficult to phrase as syllogisms of this sort. So I would suggest that this is also not a useful model of reason for our purposes. What I would suggest is that we is that we refer to a model of reason which is very recent. It's called argumentative theory and has been put forward by a couple of people called Hugo Mercier and Dan Sperber. Both of them are French and Dan Sperber at least began as an anthropologist. So these are not psychologists. These have a rather broader background than almost all psychologists that I've read on this kind of topic. What they're suggesting can be summarized by the quote 
in the box underneath the portrait of Dan Berber, who is indeed even at an advancing age. He's now 79, a very photogenic chap. Our hypothesis, they say, is that the function of reasoning is argumentative. It is to devise and evaluate arguments intended to persuade. I think this is a very plausible hypothesis in itself. Mercier and Sperber spend quite a lot of time explaining just how useful reason as a way of persuading people and evaluating arguments intended to persuade is evolutionary, evolutionarily useful. I'm sorry, I'm stumbling over my words here. So we also have a reason here in argumentative theory about why we do reason or try to reason at all. Not only this, but we also have a model of reason which includes the kind of statements, the kind of arguments that we might use in ordinary everyday context when we're trying to explain, for instance, why wages must go down or why it is impossible that they should go down. So I think it is a useful model of reason and it is one that allows us to distinguish reason from emotion in the historical record because we can recognise some aspects of ordinary language as the language of reason. For instance, when we see the word but, we may often, not always at all, I'm not saying these words, these phrases always indicate a statement belonging to the language of reason, but when we do see a statement involving the word but, we should be on the lookout for an attempt to use reason. For example, but at these wages we shall starve. This is presenting a reason why these wages should not be cut, and it's introduced by the word but. Another useful indicator is the construction if then. Even, I would say in the example, if you don't do this, then we will kill you. So that gives the person addressed a reason to do something, which may be a very powerful reason. It may not be a very nice reason. It may not be a just reason, but it is a reason. And of course, another word which should alert us to the possibility that reason is being used, or someone is at least attempting to use reason, is the word because. Because we're stronger than you, we shall win. That gives a reason why the speaker is confident that they will ultimately prevail. It is because we are stronger than you, our opponents are. Okay, notice that reason in this view is not necessarily calm. The person saying, but at these wages we shall starve, could be extremely agitated, extremely angry, or extremely distressed and upset. As I've already indicated, reason is not necessarily pleasant and it's not necessarily just. The fact that we shall win because we're stronger than you does not suggest that we're going to win because our cause is just and yours is unjust. So the idea that reason is expressed in language of sweet reasonableness, as Matthew Arnold said of Jesus, is, I think, not a useful idea, certainly not in the context of industrial relations. So the idea that reason is always sweet, calm, pleasant, just, well, I would forget those ideas. OK, so let me now go back to our main question. Why do we have this transformation from amity to anger, rage, fury? I've not yet indicated what I think we're looking at in Featherstone and the violence that followed from it. I suggested just to remind you that anger was induced by bodily or mental distress, pain, hunger, drunkenness, or that it was provoked I'm sorry, or that it was provoked by insults. So this gives us an agenda to look at. We can look first of all at pain, hunger and drunkenness. Drunkenness, I can say right away, doesn't take us very far. There are very few accusations indeed that miners involved in riots or other disturbances during this lockout were drunk. It is quite likely, of course, that some of them were, but the people you'd be expecting to voice those accusations voice them extremely rarely, if at all. So I don't think the supposition that people became angry because they were drunk is going to get us very far here. What about pain? Well, the main pain and evidence in this dispute is the pain of hunger. So I'm going to look directly at that eh, before moving on to look at the provocation of eh, anger by insults. OK, so what can we say of hunger? Hunger was certainly present and was not denied. This is a picture from the front page of the Illustrated London News in 1893. 
This is in the middle of September, so this is a week or two after the Featherstone massacre. And it's alleged to be a picture of miners' children and possibly other workers' children being fed through charitable enterprise. I have to say, I think it's at least partly fanciful. One notices just how well dressed, how clean and well dressed are the children, as well as the nurses and dispensers of charity in the picture. <coughs> Excuse me. But we do have some rather more credible. I should say credible depictions of hunger and attempts to alleviate it. This is a photograph of children waiting at a soup kitchen at Ince near Wigan in Lancashire. Again, it's from the Illustrated London News. It's a little bit later. We're at the end of September now, so we're three weeks after the massacre. And it's an appropriate illustration of an agitprop pamphlet published a couple of years after the Featherstone Massacre in 1895 by a Sheffield anarchist called David Nicholl. He produced a pamphlet called Bullets for Bread. It's not clear what David Nicholl's sources were. He may have had no basis for what he was claiming at all. But he did claim that crowds are starving. And yes, he used the present tense. Crowds are famished, he wrote, and driven mad with hunger. So he's certainly linking hunger to bodily distress eh? and bodily distress with madness or a loss of reason and an emotional, a clear emotional impact eh? is posited by Nickel in his pamphlet. Otherwise, what I suggest to you could be taken from that photograph is simply the enormous scale of the hunger induced by this very long running dispute in which, of course, mothers and others not directly involved were unable to claim any form of social security. The strike pay that the Miners Federation of Great Britain and its affiliates were able to offer was very limited indeed. We know that in Lancashire and Cheshire, for example, the union's funds were exhausted after giving out just over two weeks strike pay. Sam Wood, in his account of the dispute, the Battle of 93, wrote every day, and this was directly observed. Remember, one of his next door neighbours was a Yorkshire coal miner. Every day, many were brought face to face with starvation. Men saw that they were to be starved into submission, whereupon a spirit of hostility at once rose up in their midst. So once again, Wood is drawing a link between the bodily distress and a spirit of hostility. We could say a link between distress and emotion and indeed angry emotion. The reporter for the Manchester Guardian also wrote, the van of the attack on Acton Hall Colliery, this is referring to the Featherstone Massacre, was composed of women who urged on the men with a kind of feminine savagery made more eager by hunger and a brooding over their supposed wrongs. So again, a link is being made between hunger and an eager savagery, an emotional consequence. The other thing that emerges from these newspaper, newspaper reports is that one of the distresses of hunger was not simply the deep pain and exhaustion and anxiety induced by it, not only the grief of having to watch your children go through this ordeal, but was also the humiliation of having to beg, of having to pawn one's belongings as the weeks went by, of having to accept charity. This lockout was of people who had been used to making their own way in the world, who were used to making what was, in good times, a relatively good living, and were certainly not normal inmates of the workhouse or habitual seekers after charity. So the humiliation of begging and taking charity was mixed up with the bodily injuries involved in the hunger. And that's the end of part one. Thank you.